This is your host, Sabnil Bharatiya, on behalf of the Linux Foundation, and we have three guests with us today. Brian Pellendorf, General Manager for Blockchain, Healthcare, and Identity at the Linux Foundation. Joan Jerkovic, Senior Vice President of Operations at American Associations of Insurance Services, and Truman Esmond, Vice President of Membership and Solutions at American Association of Insurance Services. It's great to have you all on the show today. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thanks. Happy to be here. Thank you. Today's topic is the Open Insurance Data Link Platform and Project. Brent, can you tell us what is it all about? Well, as you know, the, the use of blockchain technology by enterprises uh, has grown by leaps and bounds over the last few years. And uh, it's touched all sorts of different domains, uh, including ones that are very regulatorily intensive, uh, such as insurance, such as banking, obviously, such as uh, supply chain traceability, uh, all sorts of others. Uh, and uh, this is a project that uh, AAIS started uh, uh, a couple of years ago, actually, to help harmonize uh, the reporting and the uh, and the sharing of data in the insurance industry for the management of risk. They'll tell you a lot about it. Um, but what, what they chose was to use Hyperledger Fabric as the way to build out a data sharing network um, using some governance principles that align very nicely with the kinds of things that we saw as uh, limitations in uh, many of the deployments out there uh, uh, of blockchain technology for enterprise purposes, where it was really hard to figure out what's the governance model, what's the way to actually uh, uh, come to an agreement on how to run a network like this. And so we uh, decided we're, we would like to help uh, in this space of blockchain governance. Uh, we had been talking with AIS for the last year on how a project like this might work. Uh, and so this is is really the Linux Foundation's first step into being uh, a consortium uh, focused on delivering uh, a set of use cases in uh, uh, in a particular field, uh, but using an underlying distributed ledger to serve those use cases. So we're really excited about this. I would like to know a bit more about the history and origin of OpenID project and platform. AEIS is an advisory organization in the United States. And uh, the reason we were formed is that Insurance is re regulated at the state level, but there needed to be an organization that looked at the national level of insurance, kind of providing a common set of uh, forms and then also collecting data for the regulators to report on a regional and a national basis. So we've been doing that for about 80 years. But what we're learning now is that uh, we need more data than we collected in the past. It needs to be broader and at the same time more granular. But with the concerns around data security, uh, it was becoming increasingly difficult to work with the carriers to get the data that we needed and for the, the regulators to get the data that they needed. So uh, we held some design thinking sessions to bring the regulators and the carriers and AIS and others together to talk about this problem. And we came to the conclusion that it is the security and privacy of data and the transparency in how that data is used and looking for a solution uh, to provide a new platform to the industry, uh, we looked at blockchain and found that that is a technology that brings that security, pri privacy, and transparency uh, to the exchange of information, not necessarily data in the way we've done it in the past, but how we might use smart contracts to exchange uh, information on top of this network. So with that, we started the Open IDL. You mentioned collecting a large amount of data uh, thanks to uh, the proliferation of IoT devices, smartphones. Uh, so we are uh, not only collecting a lot of data, we are also collecting different kind of data. Can you talk about how has what we collect changed over years and how uh, companies are using it to offer better premium, for example, uh, in the insurance space or uh, better services to their customers? Yes, absolutely. And our member companies, the insurance carriers in the United States, are all looking at the ways that they're going to use this, uh, the smart devices, the information that is there, uh, not only to monitor uh, risks that they cover, but also to pay claims. And this is where, uh, with these smart devices, um, IoT devices, it becomes important to have a blockchain network in, in place. The carriers, AIS, we don't want to collect all of that data that is being collected by these sensors, but we do need an immutable record so that if a water sensor checks and sees that something did fail at a certain time and an insured files a claim, we can simplify the claims process 
by having that information written on a blockchain. Now, we're not there yet with the open IDL. That's not really the first use case that we're working on, but we do believe that with the extension of open IDL and other networks, that um, the data that is collected by these uh, IoT devices really will benefit the insurance industry without them having to collect large volumes of data. You mentioned a risk factor there. Can you talk about uh, other use cases that you are looking at with this platform and project? Well, let me cover just briefly the first use case that we tackled, but to be really clear, it's not the only use case. It is the one that we started with to prove the concept, prove that it works, and it also is integrated with our mission as an advisory organization. Uh, today in the United States, uh, there are stat uh, agents that collect data from insurance carriers. We aggregate that data and we anonymize it and we send reports to regulators. Now that data isn't meeting the need of the regulators anymore. And we've learned that there are, there's over a thousand reports that get run on an annual basis where data is requested directly from a regulator. Uh, the regulator requests it from a carrier. That data gets sent in and additional reports are being produced because the stat data that we've traditionally collected is no longer sufficient. So we tackled that problem is how can we improve regulatory reporting? And at the heart of that, let's not transfer large volumes of data anymore. So inherent in the design of OpenIDL is a data store. We call it the harmonized data store. And it has some standards for how data is held in that harmonized data store. With that, a, reg a uh, carrier could put the data in the harmonized data store and prove that they've met the regulatory requirements, that the data is there. Then a regulator, when they have a new question, can use the open IDL network to ask a question of the carriers. We would like to create a report with this information in it. Uh, are you willing to participate? Again, going towards collaboration and less of a, a requirement. And the carriers can say, yes, we'd love to participate in that. We're going to run some processes here internally. We're going to run some smart contracts. We're going to deliver information back in an aggregated and anonymized way. We're not going to transfer huge uh, volumes of files to the regulators. We're just going to answer the question. A, a good example of this is when there's a catastrophe in the United States, uh, the regulators may ask the carriers in a state or a region to send a large vol volume of data because they want to know what the total insured value is for homes in that area. They don't really need to transfer all that data. They just need a response from each of the carriers. What is the total insured value that you have in this area? One number. And so this is where we're trying to improve regulatory reporting by using the harmonized data store, holding it as a secure and private data store using the network to then validate that the data is there, validate the questions that are asked of the data, that's what's actually stored on chain in the network. Now let's talk about the Linux Foundation, this project. Why and when did you decide to move the project into the Linux Foundation? Um, well, for us, uh, OpenIDL was called OpenIDL from the very beginning because we believe in open source solutions. Uh, we were always hopeful that we could eventually move our project to the Linux Foundation. Uh, we are trying to change the way the industry shares information and to do that in a very open platform. We wanted the technology to be open, the data standards to be open, and to encourage uh, the industry to participate in this network. We heard repeatedly from our member carriers that their concern about um, any organization that is forming one of these networks. One is they're concerned about proprietary solutions. They were concerned about investing in a technology and a network and then being locked in and then having few options, if any at all, in terms of the technology that they would like to use. And then the pricing model would be locked in. So being open uh, was a high priority for us. Uh, we formed a not-for-profit around this uh, organization. But again, we heard from our members. Any not-for-profit can eventually become a for-profit, again, locking them in to this technology platform. So this is why it was so important for us to be with the Linux Foundation an organization with a global uh, base of participants that really understand what open source means to provide that common infrastructure to an industry, and that there isn't a risk that when our members invest in the OpenIDL, 
that it will become a proprietary or a closed network. By, by working with the Linux Foundation, we are confident that it will remain open and available to, to grow. Brand, Linux Foundation is now home to a lot of different kind of projects. Can you talk about the structure and governance of this project? There's a very set you know, structure and governance model. You know, the Linux Foundation, uh, our core has been open source software. Uh, I think we've cracked the nut, so to speak, on how to get companies large and small, even fierce competitors, to work together on common software when they have common challenges. And really it's a, the case is uh, on not just freedom and not just you know agency and having the ability for these companies to, to, to bend the software to meet their needs, but also on cost cutting, on, on ways to uh, I, you know do the things together that you have to do to be in an industry, especially when it comes to something like regulatory reporting. No one differentiates their business on regulatory reporting, right? Um, so, so on open source software, we know that and obviously the development of the software is a big part of this project. We have a code base uh, that has been built by AIS, working with some, some of the partners coming in to bootstrap this. Um, it is still early days of the project, but there is running code in that classic rough consensus and running code kind of uh, IETF uh, frame, right? Um, but it's about more than code. It's also about the specifications, making sure that there's ways to plug that software in into the back end systems of the insurance carriers. Um, it's also about more than just the insurance carriers. We have several partners involved who are technology infrastructure partners. Uh, these are ones who are uh, there to work with the carriers, but also potentially work with other types of organizations who might plug into this network. Um, so it's software, it's specifications, but it's also an open network. And this is what's kind of new for us. When you talk about open networks, I think everyone has different ideas in their head of what that means or what that looks like. Um, <clears throat> when I think about the governance of an open network, uh, I think about things like the domain name system. How did we get to a, a, a working global DNS system without it becoming a function of the UN or a function of some other like international body? I, but, but how do we get it through ICANN, right? And that was by practicing kind of minimum viable governance at the center of a set of legal relationships that bind certain anchors in that trust ecosystem. In the case of the domain name system, those are the domain name registrars, right? In the case of something like this, it'll be the carriers and some of the other participants in the network acting as these trust anchors, running nodes on, the, on this network, keeping it decentralized, but decentralized within the bounds of a community. And uh, the governance model we've set up is a pretty straightforward one. It's, you know, how we do governance on open source projects, which is it's transparent. It's uh, the door is open. You will have to be a member of OpenIDL in order to stand up a node on the OpenIDL network. Um, but we think that's that's appropriate because that's a way to bind the participants to uh, a set of things that go beyond uh, uh, what open source software does. Uh, and um, there's more information about this at the OpenIDL website. Uh, and, and we've also done some writing on what these kinds of open governance network should look like. But it really is inspired by you know, trying to understand what has made open source software work as a governance mechanism, what has made open standards and specifications work uh, as, a, as, a, as a process, and trying to say, look, we build the most value for everybody, the more people we can bring into this network and the more public we can be about it. Um, you just have to balance that with the operations uh, of, of uh, a blockchain network, which are very different from the operations of publishing open source code, uh, and, and recognizing that we exist in a range regulated space with insurance and, and so many of these other use cases. And so uh, another a final big part of this is how do we involve the regulators? Uh, how do we involve uh, uh, other types of government agencies as first class participants in this network, not to let them dictate the roadmap or dictate the direction, um, but to make them feel like they can, they can perform the role that they need to perform in the industry and everybody needs them to perform in the industry to help uh, manage the risks and make sure that uh, everybody's, everybody's a good actor in the ecosystem. Can you talk a bit about, uh, I don't want you to get into the technical details of the software stack, but uh, what kind of roadmap you have for the release of the software. And since you are uh, heading a couple of <laughs> projects at the Linux Foundation, what kind of cross-pollination do you see within the foundation which will help this project? Because it will be le leveraging not only a lot of software, a lot of code, but a lot of networking capability and also infrastructure that is being created by other projects. The software stack at OpenIDL, it does include Hyperledger Fabric, uh, uh, fortuitously. Um, there is no requirement that they run Hyperledger technologies or that any Linux Foundation hosted project like OpenIDL decide to, to, to use 
Hyperledger Fabric or any other Hyperledger project. It really is up to that community, the open ideal technical community to decide what the rest of their stack is. But it is a combination of Fabric and some chain code written specifically for that, along with interface code uh, to be able to connect it to backend systems and query it, um, but also components like MongoDB uh, uh, and others to implement this, this harmonized data store. So it is a stack of technologies. Um, and with OpenIDL in the Linux Foundation ecosystem, we do plan to connect it to the different events that happen. The Hyperledger Global Forum coming up uh, in June, for example, uh, one event I, uh, is, uh, is one event Open Idea will be presenting at. There's other open source summits and and, and other face to face events, as well as channels uh, uh, from social media point of view and 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 PR points of view and like, uh, as well as other related projects. Uh, we are we don't have any other insurance related projects in uh, uh, in, in the Linux Foundation, but as you mentioned with AgStack. Uh, and some of the other more recent projects in energy, for example, uh, uh, and in, in the financial sector, I certainly see bridges, uh, opportunities to build bridges with those organizations. Talk about common technologies. I mean, there's you know, a lot of this stack that is inside Open IDL is not actually specific to insurance and the ability to use it perhaps for information sharing in other industries, in climate, for example, uh, could be really powerful. So we're, we're certainly going to be looking at how do we get some, some synergy going with other projects under the LF banner or even beyond. Excellent. Thanks. Truman, if you can just talk about, uh, of course, there is already a kind of you know community around the project, but as part of the Linux Foundation project, uh, what kind of community or ecosystem we can expect around Open Ideal as the project grows? Absolutely. So it starts really from the core data elements, which are the policies and claims that are in the distributed data network supported by Open Ideal. So each participating carrier as a data owner has this information in their data store according to the rules of the harmonized data structures, uh, harmonized data store which is not just structure, but how it got there and that data that exists is trusted for a particular purpose. So we've got monthly policy and claim data coming into the, to the store that can be that is good enough for regulatory reporting. Then at that point, it's how we can use it. So it's the initial case is the annual regulatory reporting as well as all the data calls. There are over 1600 that Joan mentioned um, that our, our member carriers are subject to. And we're gonna basically be uh, automating those to allow the regulators better, you know, uh, uh, the ability to get better insights to what's happening in their market so they can write better policy so we can build better insurance products and take care of other risk situations. Where the network will expand are the, and where it's going right away now is you mentioned IoT devices, which is the is definitely coming on the radar, but the first one, the first other data owners that are joining the network are the regulators and then as well as the uh, catastrophe models and the intellectual property folks that have either data aggregation around uh, geospatial information or uh, models for intelligently mapping different risks, flood, crime, uh, you know, as well as those, how those relate to other data stores like weather. So as the storm approaches, who's in danger? And this is a question, like Joan said, where is the risk out there? And then as the storm gets closer, what can they do to mitigate? And then as it passes, what do they do to to clean up and how do they help make sure their communities are, are solved. So that's the, the the real use case, but we're starting to bring in more people into the network, as, uh, as Brian mentioned, first tier participants actually in, in the network, not just connecting via APIs, but actually having their proprietary information, be it an algorithm or uh, an aggregated data store, connected as a harmonized data store to the broader network. Right? So. That's where the, the power really comes in. So now those third-party data stores can not only be accountable, but they also can be incorporated into a very dynamic, parametric, and, uh, and, and timely experience for the ultimate business of risk transfer. Uh, talking about bringing in more members, uh, of course, this one is specific to American institution, but most of the Linux project, foundation projects are global. Uh, will the scope of this project be limited to the US, or North America, or what about uh, Europe or other countries? Can they also benefit? But the thing is, uh, regulatory uh, the requirements are different there. I mean, Europe is very, very strict when it comes to uh, privacy and data. So, so can you talk about the scope, or regional scope of this project? If I, if I may, absolutely. And that's the, one of the uh, governance committees we have under OpenIDL is the Applications Governance Committee. Because this, the, what AEIS, the American Association of Insurance Services, which has very, you know, a specific scope, property casualty in the United States, 
Um, that's what we're using it for. But the underlying technology and what our members are using it for, you know, as you look down inside the enterprise, and most of them are multinational organizations, uh, you know, also, you know, part of large reinsurers. And they're looking at incorporating this into other initiatives globally because the pattern, when you boil it down, is data ownership and, and transparency. You know, without so you can keep the data private and get the information to the people that need it in a timely fashion, in a trusted way, uh, you know, according to whatever the trust level it is that you need to do it. You know, you might need it to be higher to pay a commission or move large amounts of money. But if you're just going to send somebody a notification, maybe to batten down the hatches, maybe that's a little, uh, you know, you'd have to trust it quite as far. So um, that's the that's where it's going, you know, from a fundamental standpoint. Internationally, we're already looking at many use cases that are not not just beyond the regulatory part of PNC insurance, but uh, but expand into it. And certainly as we look at, as we built open IDL, one of the big concerns that we were looking to address was GDPR. Certainly that's a challenge when you look at ledger solutions, uh, you know, and data on chain. So we had to get around that and we think we are not get around it, but work, uh, you know, within the context of that. And, and we think we've got really a, uh, an ideal privacy solution that can be applied to the fundamental technology and connection of networks through the open governance of the Linux Foundation for the purposes of different levels of trust and the technology being open can follow our model. And in fact, can you know, really replicate exactly what we've done as AEIS for PNC regulatory structures. And you can apply it or pivot it either into you know, neighboring countries or, or other um, you know, communities, however you define that. Yeah, well, the international question is, I, I think, a really relevant one. I mean, right now, the use cases have been uh, uh, driven by a set of needs from uh, the U.S. regulators and uh, uh, carriers focused on the U.S. markets. But uh, it, insurance is a global phenomenon. Uh, the, the need to share data to manage risk and build better models is a global uh, concept. There are global standards in this uh, domain that, that people are operating against. And I think actually uh, shared open source software around meeting regulatory requirements might actually be a way to help harmonize some of those regulatory requirements. Um, it might be a way to, to bring us closer together to uh, to a safer world. So um, the idealist in me says, sure, the door is open. The, the pragmatist says, you know, we need to uh, also be engaging the regulators and, uh, but also just like demonstrating that there's value in this core uh, approach uh, before getting too too broad about it. But uh, I'm always an under promise and over deliver kind of guy. So uh, I'm, I'm secretly very optimistic that that uh, this can be a key uh, force for glo- the global insurance industry. One quick point, um, something that we get asked a lot is how, you know, what makes OpenIDL different from other, you know, consortia and blockchain networks. And, and we kind of touched on it, but it's really a couple of very key things is that one thing that you mentioned is the regulators are first tier citizens, first tier participants in this network, and they trust it to use for existing regulatory infrastructure, which is required. One thing we, one common refrain we hear across, you know, really blockchain networks of all kinds is that regulators are the challenge. And we see it in cryptocurrency, we see it in, you know, uh, in financial transactions and all kinds of other things there. In this case is the regulators are, have been involved in the development and are, you know, again, part of the community and the network. It wasn't developed solely by insurers. And then the regulators were invited to participate after the fact they were involved in there from the beginning. So they can trust it. They know how, how it works from a transparent perspective. And then again, the other part of it is the, the framework within which it operates is, is already regulatory acceptable. And that's our role. And we're disintermediating ourselves so that, as Joan mentioned, our purpose can move much faster um, and, and really solve the, the, the goal of the, of the industry. And those two things make it unique, being open from the, from the bottom up, having the regulators as an infrastructure that ch- ties it to a regulatorily accepted framework and then the other thing is that actually it's connected to real property, right? You know, where we're talking about actual buildings, actual businesses, actual homes, actual cars, actual things that are real with real experience that can be trusted for, you know, again, a, a, an increasing variety of purposes. Uh, and the data sources that relate to those things can be increasingly distributed because those, you know, if you're, if you're aggregating data, then you're going to be less timely as well as a target, which was fundamentally our situation where we didn't, we didn't want to be the big aggregation of data, but we needed information from the, uh, in an aggregate fashion. 
you know, these are early days for the project still, uh, especially in its incarnation as a Linux Foundation project, as an open source project. Uh, the door is wide open uh, uh, to, to all sorts of different directions we can head in. Like any open source project, uh, history is made by those who show up. So if this is a domain of interest for you, uh, even if it's really just understanding how might a block, an open blockchain network like this work, I, I really invite all of you to come to openideal.org, uh, register your interest, join a mailing list, and uh, and get to know us better. Awesome. Brian, Joan, Truman, thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about uh, this project. Uh, I look forward to talk to you uh, again because I'm sure there will be a lot of updates uh, about the project. So thanks for your time today. Thank you, Swapnil. Thanks. Happy to be here. Thank you.